the fresh prince of the demon continent. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to Anime Club After Dark, the podcast that delves into all things anime, manga, and otaku culture related. I'm your host Alex, but you can call me Senpai, and joining me tonight, I have our czar of source material, John. I know what you're going to say. It's too early for this. No, actually, I'm feeling fine. I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) I wanted to feel like Joseph Joestar there for a second. Your next line is... (laughs) I mean, I'm always tired. Everyone knows this. We always record right when I wake up. At, fair enough. Yes, yeah, it's, it's true. We we typically do. Um, there's very, it, it's very rare anymore when we record, especially when it's you, me, and Natai, that it's not shortly after you wake up. Um, but <laughs> anyway, uh, tonight you and I have gotten together to talk about uh, part two of Mushoku Tensei, one of the best anime of 2021. In fact, it's so damn good, we gave it anime of the year. I mean, good? <laughs> I'm I'm very surprised at how well Mushoku Tensei did, honestly speaking. Like, because mm. when, I remember when we were watching the preview for it, it was kind of like, what did Sho say? The animation was held together by, like, duct tape and string. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was exactly what uh, Show said during our um, our preview episode where we talked about this. And to be fair, the PV did not do the show justice at all. Like it did not give you any sense of what the show itself was going to be about, especially how good the animation turned out being. Well, I mean, I knew what the show was going to be about, so I knew it was going to be a good story at least. But <laughs> mm. I'm glad that but you, the. Uh... But you you admit though that 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 PV left a lot to be desired in terms of its animation. Oh yeah, like it definitely didn't look like it was going to be as good as it is. Hmm. And you're someone who's read the sort. Well, you've read the original source material, the web novel. Yeah. You haven't read the light novel, which is what they're actually basing this this adaptation on. No, I haven't. But read I it. think you you have a general idea of where the story is going. Um. And like, like you said, you, you, and you said it to us during that preview episode, it's like, wow, I, I, this is a pretty decent story, but God, they look like they're going to fucking butcher this adaptation. Thank God we were proven wrong. I mean, I always hope they don't butcher any adaptation, right? <laughs> I, I mean, I always hope for the best, <laughs> um, but uh, let's actually get into the meat and potatoes of this thing. So this is actually our second uh, spoiler cast we've done for Mishoku Tensei. Uh, if you haven't gone and watched or listened to our uh, part one of our spoiler cast for Mushoku Tensei, I highly recommend that, where we talk about the first uh, 11 episodes of uh, this adaptation. Uh, it was a split core adaptation. The, the second half, which was originally set to premiere in July of 2021, was delayed to October, the fall season. Um, at the time, it was said it was due to, quote-unquote, various circumstances. Um, we still, to this day, have never been explained what those circumstances were. I'm just going to go ahead and say it was probably the coof. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, we were graced with four OPs throughout this uh, half season. Um that was amazing. And it's something else I wanted I definitely want to talk about is like these OPs, right? It's so unique in terms of anime OPs because you don't just cut away to this like AMV style, you know, really fast animation showcasing characters and settings and 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 action sequences. You actually get these these vignettes that are there's actual storytelling going on in the background and it's something we talked about in the first part and I fucking love it so fucking much. Yeah, it's really fun to see, like, so they don't usually talk during these opening sequences while they play that the music, and mm-hmm. the music was so similar for all the OPs that I didn't even notice there was, like, four different versions, <laughs> to be honest. Mm-hmm. And they all, ha- they all have the word song in their title. Um, the first one that we hear in the second half is called The Awakening Song. The second one is called The Inheritance Song. The third one is called The Prayer Song, and the fourth one is called A Distant Child Guard Song. Yeah, I definitely didn't know. I kind of, no, no, they sound the same to me. I didn't really notice. But, yeah, the opening sequence. Because you were paying attention to what was going on, though. Yeah, because there's actual, like, because at the beginning, I thought it was just going to be like, oh, it's just a silent montage where it introduces, like, um, oh, this is the characters doing stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But there are some sequences where there's audio, and 
yeah, it's just an introduction into the area that they're in, and paying attention to it is just... I, I wouldn't say it was integral to the story, like, oh, this opening, you had to pay attention, you know? Like, it was just nice, right? It's a little bit of flavor for the world. Like, we're watching them explore cities or doing whatever they're doing that day, and it feels mm. like we're there. Like, we're already... We've, we're supposed to, like, have a sense of disbelief and kind of see that we're there, like, eagle-eye view over the character, but... It's just nice to see the towns. It was great. It was a great excuse for them to show off some great background art too, especially like with the establishing shots that you see during those OP sequences. Oh God, some of it was so beautiful. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I hate saying this because I feel it's one of the things that makes Mushoku Tensei unique among anime adaptations. But I really wish more anime would would experiment like this with their OPs and EDs. Um. I feel like, like you say, it adds an, a great amount of flavor to the adaptation um, itself. And you get to see, you know, more of the world. You get to see some great art. You get to maybe even see some good animation. Um, and you can, there's even a little bit of storytelling, like I said, that's done in um, in these OP sequences. And it's fascinating to watch. Um, I, I definitely hope if this, uh, well, I have to imagine that this anime adaptation will continue. Um, especially since an entire studio was formed just to create it. Um, I hope that they keep this up with the OP is going forward. See, because I really like seeing it. I actually don't know how I would feel if other anime started copying uh when Mushoku Tensei did. Because the reason Mushoku Tensei was so successful in doing this is because this is a story about a guy, right, who's a piece mm-hmm. of shit who wants to be a better person, and the backdrop of that is this beautiful world that he's in now. And it makes sense that there's a lot of, like, inner monologuing. There's a lot of fucking just pretty things. Like, he's seeing things for the first time because in his previous life, he was a neat. So he didn't go outside after, like, being bullied in high school. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense, like, in the story for the OP to just be, like, an establishing scene of here's just a minute and a half of here's where they are. Like, here is the village or here is the town or whatever. And it helps you get set there, and it makes sense. I don't know if any other anime could do that just as well. Mainly because, like, not a lot of other anime uh, have really strong writing, so... (laughs) True. (laughs) Well, certainly a lot of isekai anime. (laughs) Yeah, not a lot of isekai anime are very strong in the writing department, so... Mm. Uh, I think the ED also deserves uh, some special mention, specifically because of how much symbolism there is in the visuals in that ED, with all the windows and him looking through them and 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 you know trying to find a new way forward. I I really really liked uh, all the symbolism that was in uh, that ED. Uh, the the piece of music in there is called uh, "The Way to Go with the Wind," uh, Kazeto Iku Michi. Um, was very very close to being our ed of the year and our award show as well um uh we're worth noting that all of the openings and endings performed in both parts one and part two were performed by uh uh yubiko ohara uh so beautiful voice again I, perhaps uh uh get ohara back for the second season That'd be nice. Um, but anyway, moving on, because we do have a lot to talk about, because a surprising amount happened in uh, just 12 episodes of uh, the second part of Mishoka Tensei. So we start off with uh, episode 12 of uh, 23. So we're, when we left off, we had um, Rugerd, Eris, and Rudy, basically Rudy and his party, uh, had made it to a coastal city on the edge of uh, the demon continent, and they didn't know that Roxy had arrived on the same continent to look for them, uh, and she was accompanied by two of Paul's former companions. Um, This takes place after the mana disaster, obviously, that teleported multiple people from uh, the central... Is it called the central continent? Yeah. Where they were from yeah um they transported multiple people from the central continent just away to various parts of the world um and so that's really where we pick up um and uh we see for the first two episodes roxy and rudy essentially play hide and seek with each other they're literally in the same damn city and they never meet 
Yeah, and it's like that in the novel too. And I, I really liked how the anime did it because obviously in the novel you're reading like Rudy's perspective and then you read Roxy's perspective and you're like, oh, hey, they were in there during the same time, right? Based on events mm-hmm. that happened. But having the little like fucking Benny Hill type of animation where Rudy <laughs> goes this way, Roxy appears and goes the other way and it's just like, you know, like <laughs> fucking Benny yeah. Hill. So I, I liked it. Yeah, I thought that was funny. And, it I you know, it makes sense. Like, it, it seems like the city itself is kind of a sizable city. Um, and it makes sense that they might not just bump into each other just because they happen to be in the same city. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> you don't just randomly run into people. That's a very small chance in such a big city. Yeah. Like, yeah. you could be in the same city. If it city. were Rudy's hometown, yeah, I could see yeah. them bumping into each other because it's, it's a small village. But that that big city, that big port city that they're in, nah, I I, I just don't see that happening. I see it that very accurate. I think as to how it would probably be. You could be that close to each other and not see each other. Um, also, find out that Rouger is a very expensive traveling companion because he like he carries a premium to go across the ocean. It's because he's a demon, right? So a lot yeah. of the demons on the demon continent aren't really allowed to go across the ocean because you know they're demons and Mm -hmm. so that's why it's expensive to take him across because no merchant would want to actually do that since demons are kind of seen as like you know in typical fantasy settings uh, demons are like the bad ones right Mm -hmm. so that's why yeah, I mean, it's one of the great things I like about Rougier. He's such a uh, he's such a great spokesperson for his race because he's definitely subverting everyone's expectations about what he should be. Like every time he meets someone, they're like, "Wait a minute, you're spared? You don't act like all the ones I've heard of." <laughs> well, yeah. So the superior racism were um a race of like battle freak demons who were loyal to the demon emperor or the demon king, demon emperor Laplace. Some some dude, yeah. right? No, it's Demon King, not Demon Emperor. We meet a Demon Emperor, <laughs> yeah. though. So, uh, Laplace, uh, because of Laplace and his war, like, to try to unite the Demon Continent and just take over the world, mm-hmm. everyone fears the Superit, because the Superit are, like, the strongest kind of warriors around. <laughs> like, Demon Warriors. Because they... Yeah. They're a spirit... So, they're spirit users, but those spears are actually formed of their spirit, so their spirit actually never breaks. <laughs> As long as their wills don't break, so it makes them really hard to fight. It's like literally, they believe the harder they believe, the stronger they get. Man, if only it worked that way in real life. Yeah, I know. Mm. <laughs> um, uh, we also get a reappearance of the man god. Uh, this this dude uh, can he be trusted? Who knows? <laughs> um, he, I like how he just appears and uh, like you know. Appears and reappears like Q from fucking Star Trek, just to tell him, "Hey, go do this, and something might happen." I'm not gonna tell you what. <laughs> um, yeah, he tells him to go buy his food in a very specific place, and he does this, and he stumbles upon literally the best character in this entire show. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna butcher this name, by the way. Uh, Demon Ember Kishirika Kishirisu. <laughs> It's not too bad. God, I love pronunciation. Her. Yeah, she's a. Uh, I wouldn't say she's too big of a character in the overall theme of the book, but it's <laughs> she's funny. <laughs> like, ha 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 ha! I am the great <laughs> demon emperor, but I have no she's, money. <laughs> she's she's literally Satanya. I don't know. If she's, she's actually literally Satanya. Also, I love her character design. Don't judge me. Yeah, uh, yeah, fucking lowly man. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, and in meeting her, he gets uh, Rudy gets a demon eye. Yeah, which comes in handy. Yeah. So, Demon Emperor Kishirika is the Emperor of Magic Eyes or some shit, or the Demon of Magic Eyes, which is like super powerful because you can have a magic eye to do like a bunch of stuff, right? But mm-hmm. the problem is that so Rudy is not, I would say, your typical OPMC, right? Um. He gets the demon eye, but he can't control it very well because it takes a lot, it siphons a lot of mana to use it, mm-hmm. and there's like a lot of processing power. So it's kind of that uh, isekai or not isekai, the fantasy trope of like to control magic, you have to be pretty smart. So it's another 
way to hint that Rudy's not too smart still. Like, he may be smart in the context of, like, a compared to, like, a peasant, but compared to, like, magic users who are book studying and shit like that, he's yeah. not too smart. And he's also smart in the sense that, like, he's a middle-aged man in a child's body, so obviously he has a, a certain amount higher intelligence than your average child. Yeah, so, but it's just the little showcase of, like, yeah, he may have a demon eye, but he's not too smart because <laughs> he can't yeah. control it. He doesn't properly. know exactly how to use it. That's one of the things I like about how Rudy is portrayed. Like, yeah, he's portrayed as being OP in this world, but he has to like work hard to use his op That, wow, that came out sounding really, his op get it? <laughs> anyway, um, his, like his powers, he actually has to sit down and, uh, focus and learn how to use these powers he's not just given these powers and immediately knows how to use them <clears throat> rimuru that's because rimuru has the great sage that's okay fair enough <laughs> i mean maybe if rudy had a great sage he might be able to use these powers out, out the gate too yeah but uh right when he gets the demon eye he's like all right eris will fight and this is kind of an important thing this is actually the first time he's ever beaten eris in a sword fight mm -hmm. so it was a bigger event in the novel than it was in the anime but it signifies uh, his growth. It's like one of the checkpoints, you know, like he was finally able to beat Eris without using uh, like completely just he would be able to beat her if he used magic and like what he did with like Paul and stuff like where he turned the ground into mud. Mm -hmm. But he's never been able to actually just beat her with just sword skills, even though technically he used magic with his demon eyes. So it wasn't just sword skills. <laughs> yeah. So after all this happens, uh, on his way back to uh, his party, Rudy ends up bumping into someone who he accidentally saves his life uh, using the demon eye by pushing him out of the way of a falling pot. Um, and you find out later that uh, he may have a way to get them across the ocean. Yeah, so... Uh, this guy... Oh, go ahead. Hitogami is the one who is like, or the man god, is like, hey, go do this thing and it might help you on your journey, right? So mm -hmm. he's very suspicious, right? <laughs> he's super sus because he, 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 it's like he tells you how to do certain things, but then doesn't tell you what the ultimate end goal of those things is going to be. He's like, well, I suggest you could do this thing and then find out what happens. Yeah. And it's like supposedly this one, this person is the, uh, is a god of this world, right? And he tells you to do things that should help you, but you don't know why. And Rudy's very He only very gives you, cautious. like, 30% of the information you need. <laughs> well, like, because of <laughs> how they portray the man god, they make it so he seems really bad to trust, right? Mm-hmm. Like, just because of his flippant attitude and how he treats things. He seems just like an overall... He's hella sus. And <laughs> I think it's funny <laughs> how he's portrayed in the end. I, I really like it uh, as a character. Like, I don't want to spoil anything too far. Because <laughs> we can talk a little bit more about it later when we get to Orsted. Yeah, but... because he, he appears multiple times in the second part. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we find out that uh, Gallus, the guy that, that, that Rudy saves, uh, has a way to, uh, to get across the ocean. Uh, because he works with a group of smugglers who need some help liberating some goods. Um, so Rudy and company agree to do this for them, even though it seems hella sus. Um, and they finally get to uh, Zantport. Um, when they get to Zantport Wait, and they on. reach the smuggler's hideout. You missed, what? So there is something that happens. that Again, it's a big deal because it's about personal growth between characters. So before uh, Rudy takes Gallus' deal, right? Rijard is like, we can't do anything evil. No evilness, no murdering, whatnot, unless they try to kill us mm -hmm. first, right? That's his whole deal. As a super Yeah, only, only the only thing you kill people for is in self-defense. So because of this, Rudy was like, yeah, we could definitely pay. Um, we The only way he could think of to get Rijard over the Demon Continent was to sell his staff, the one that Eris gave him for his birthday, right? And yeah. he actually is about to custom made. Yeah, a custom made staff, and he's going to go sell it, right? He get, wakes up in the middle of the night, and he's going to go sell it at the market, and Re Rijard stops him, right? And Rijard's like... What are you fucking doing? Like, why are you going to sell that? And he's like, because I can't think of any other options. And it's a really impactful scene because then Rougerd finally says, like, you can trust us, you know, you can rely on us. And Rudy's like, I know that and I do trust you, but there's no other way that we can get you there with us. 
because I'm not abandoning you. So then Ruggiero sees that, and he finally, like, goes and, uh, not, how, how do I want to phrase this? He finally says, like, uh, he gives some leeway to, like, how he wants to, uh, to the, to the slaver deal. Because he was like, yeah. Ruggiero was like, I can overlook a little bit, bit of evil now. And it's a big piece of character development for Ruggiero and Rudy. Just, you missed that. <laughs> I had to take yeah. talk a little bit about that before they, uh, and then obviously they go and, to the smuggler, we're like, all right, we'll pay you the money. Smuggle us, smuggle Ruggiero across. Me and Eris are gonna ride the boat. Yeah, and then we'll uh, we'll do whatever job you want for us once we get there. Yeah. Um, and so they get to this hideout, right? And they find out that the the uh, the goods, quote unquote, that they're supposed to be liberating are actual children being held captive. Um, and that's not good. <laughs> yeah. Human trafficking is not good, boys and girls. So it turns out that they, I mean, we knew, I knew that the smugglers were obviously bad people, right? Like, oh, obviously yeah, like any they're type, smugglers. Yeah. They couldn't have been good people. So it's pretty crazy that uh, Ruggier sat in the prison for, I think it was like a week or something after they got there, before they could even mm-hmm. get Ruggier out. And he just sat there and he didn't murder everyone, yeah. like instantly murder everyone like he would have normally. Because, and he could have. Yeah, of course he could have. He's a superior. And again, that shows his growth as a character. Ruggiero is a very big part of uh, Rudy's experiences on the Demon Continent. Like, quite obviously, he's the guardian protecting the party and stuff. But it's mm. nice to see the characters that in Mushoku Tensei, like the side characters, they make up a lot of the um, world as well. And that's what I really like. Because Ruggiero was the main focus with the Demon Continent arc. And you know, how he wants to clear the superior name and basically give back to the world because of all the evil that the superior did, right? He wants to repent. Yeah. And it's just insane that he would, he stopped being so hot-headed and just, like, straight up murdering people, and he thought about consequences that happened to other people because of his, um, how much he respects and cares for Rudy. Because he didn't want Rudy to, like, obviously he wants to murder these smugglers for kidnapping kids and beating them and stuff. And he's again. He sat in there, he, hearing this, just like not murdering or rising at all, which is nuts. Yeah, for an entire week. That's crazy, dude. Mm-hmm. That's crazy good growth for Ruggier. It is. Uh, it just like and he, again, we we'll go back to it multiple times. It just it goes down to how well the characters are written in this story. And then uh, that brings into like so. Then when Rudy goes and <laughs> releases Ruggier or go gets Ruggier, Ruggier like is obviously like he's about to blow but rudy's like thinking well if you we can't fight all of them we're gonna cause a scene like he's kind of like we can just turn a blind eye you know we've already turned a blind eye for so long we can do just a little bit more but then deep down inside he knows it's fucking wrong so then he's like he finally decides you know what fuck it like it's more (laughs) important to save the kids than it is to like keep my hands clean so then he lets Richard loose and they kill everyone. Yeah. Um, I also like how they get all the way out and then the kids are like, wait a minute, the dog. Oh, yeah. And then Rudy's sp- like, God damn it. <laughs> I guess I'll go back. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then that's how he ends up getting captured uh, by the Beastmen. So Rudy gets ended up get ends up getting captured, um, and the Beastmen take him prisoner and take them back um, to their village. And that gets us to the second uh, major arc, I guess, for this uh, half season, and that's uh, Doldia Village, where uh, Rudy gets in prison for a little over a week. Uh, at some point, he gets uh, – jo- oh, one thing I want to mention is I love when um, they do come back and he's in the prison. He starts describing it as an apartment, a rent-free apartment, <laughs> which if you think about it, every prison cell is a rent-free apartment. Yeah. The thing I was more most excited for during this part was the uh, – how are they going to handle the geese scene? So <laughs> mm. in the book, it's described that he's laying down on his side like a Buddha statue, like the one in Thailand, mm-hmm. that big Buddha statue where he's laying on his side. So he's laying like that naked and he greets Geese like, welcome, newbie, <laughs> to the prison. <laughs> and I'm just like, I hope they keep that in there. I really do. I hope that he's laying down on his side and he's just like, welcome. <laughs> and I was not disappointed. Fucking hilarious. 
Yeah, it was. That, that entire scene was hilarious. Um, also, I, I couldn't help but wonder, why did they strip him naked, but yet leave Geese's clothes on? I don't know, actually. <laughs> it's a great... Why did they strip him naked? That's never explained why they strip him naked. I would understand if, if you know, they stripped Geese naked too, but they didn't. I wonder if it's just because of what he did with the sacred beast, because they thought he was, like, raping the sacred beast or something, and they thought that it was such a, like, a, a slight that they had to do something just as bad to him. So it's like, all right, we're going to take your dignity away while you're in here. I honestly cannot remember why they strip searched him, but not Geese, but... He- I, feel, I I I kind of felt like that may have been something that had been explained in the in the source material and just left out of the anime, but maybe not. I don't know. I honestly don't remember that because if anyone out there is is listening to this and and actually knows, like in either the manga adaptation or the light novel adaptation, knows why he was stripped naked, I'd love to know if there's a reasoning behind that that's ever given. Um. But yeah, they uh, for a few days they're together in the uh, in the prison cell. They're kind of getting acquainted and they know each other. Um, and then the village itself is attacked uh, by the same group of smugglers uh, trying to kidnap more of the beast children. Um, and uh, Gallus reveals himself to be the head of the smuggling ring. Who would have fucking figured that out? <laughs> a little slow on the uptake there, Rudy. Um, but yeah, that it's pretty brutal that scene because you're seeing like people just getting stabbed right through the fucking heart. Um, that's pretty brutal. Um, but then you know Rudy and, and Geese escape and they you know they take down some of these attacking smugglers, but they're not able to take down Gallus. He's apparently a pretty damn good uh, fighter. And uh, when Rudy himself realizes that he probably can't defeat him on his own, he considers letting him escape. Um, and it's, he has this inner monologue while this is happening and it shows, it's very telling about how far that he's come so far in his journey, but yet he still has so far to go because he keeps like internally wanting to go back to how he was and just saying, fuck the world. I'm just going to go my own way and, and, and not worry about anything else. But then there's this voice inside him saying, no, this isn't right. You got to stand up and do something. Yeah, and especially since, like, he's been in prison for a week now, right? And he was being treated Mm -hmm. very poorly by the Beast people. So, like, Mm -hmm. why should you care? Like, why should you care that they're being even attacked? Who cares? They treat you Mm -hmm. like shit, and they kind of deserve it, right? And that's just, like, his old personality creeping through of, like, take the easy route out and this and that, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's just, it's so telling that we, we keep going back to this. It's like, you know, as, as much as he may have changed in some ways, he still has this temptation to just slip back into how he was every so often, especially when, when struggles like this come up. Um, but the sacred beast himself arrives to help. And then the sacred beast, Rudy and geese are able to defeat Gallus in a wonderfully animated fight scene. Um, and then, uh, we find out that uh, Eris and Rogerd, uh weren't coming to save his ass because they were actually busy helping these same beast people wipe out the rest of the smuggling ring. Actually, what happened in the beginning was... Um, so Gallus actually explains this a little bit. He's, he monologues a little bit about it. So Eris and Rogerd were pissed that Rudy got kidnapped, right? And mm-hmm. Gallus was like, oh man, it was those beastmen. So then he tricked Eris and Rogerd into like fighting the beastmen. Like the... Uh, I think it was the yeah the village chief originally went to go find the kids right in the city when they split yeah. up and it was his group that find Eris and Rogerd and they like fight each other but off screen like they they were doing that and once they fought though the village chief was like give us back our kids and Rogerd's like give us back Rudy right and then he's like wait who the fuck's Rudy I don't know who that is <laughs> and then Eris and Rogerd learn the truth like oh this is actually a smuggling ring, this and that. And so then Gallus actually put this plan together where it's like, well, I knew Eris and Rogerd were going to, they were strong. So I was going to use them as a distraction. Right. So while they were fighting the Doldeans and like trying to set up fight the rest of the camp, Gallus was going to go raid the main village. Like it was all part of his plan. He's very conniving. (laughs) Sasuke. Yeah. He's a very, uh, all, all according to Keikaku, except the part where, you know, you get defeated. <laughs> well, he doesn't think he'd, he'd be defeated because he's uh, a, I don't think he was a sword king. I don't remember what level he is, but he learns the North God style. And North God style is like very, it's a very unpredictable, 
like attack and defense. It's like a drunken master style in kung fu. You know, if you've ever watched any old kung fu movies, mm-hmm. like the reason it works so well is because like you can't tell what's a feint and what's an attack. And North God style is very similar to that, where you fight and adapt while you're fighting, where it's kind of just like you do whatever. <laughs> It's a very good counter to people who only know form and stuff. So that's why Gallus is super uh, good at fighting, because he's in the North God style. Mm. It's a very unpredictable fighting style. All right. And then after, at the very end of this episode, we actually get like a little vignette going back uh, to Fatoa, where uh, Eris' grandfather ends up taking the blame for the situation that happened in the city after the mana disaster. Um, he gets stripped of his position and has his head cut off. So... This would have been a lot more impactful if, remember how I said, Eris' grandfather had a little bit bigger of a role to play in Rudy's life and stuff. And Yeah, and you you said in our first part of this that that was kind of left out a lot in the anime. Yeah, they definitely didn't pursue it, and that's a shame because it's a really good flavor text, and, you know, this scene where his grandfather, yeah, it would be his grandfather as well, gets executed would be a lot more impactful. <laughs> a lot more. Because, again... Yeah. The whole, like, he was the first one to accept Rudy into the family, and once that opens up, like, the rest of uh, Eris' family opens up to Rudy, and he finally feels like he belongs instead of just being a stranger in this house. It's a big deal for his personal growth. So this would be, this is a bigger, impactful thing for Rudy and company, and I'm sad that they didn't include that, but I get why. Like, again, overall, it doesn't mean Jack shit's the big plot of the story, but... It's just good flavor text, damn it. At this time, I mean, really, what you're seeing as an anime watcher, you're just seeing that the natural consequences, quote unquote, of what's happened away from the main characters. Yeah, and also... Um, It's also showing you that the the world isn't revolving around what's happening with the main characters either. Like, the world is moving on. Stuff is happening away from our main characters. Well, this also showcases a little bit of... There's a little bit of uh, political intrigue splattered throughout uh we'll definitely see more of that in the next season just a tiny smidge more but i yeah I, I figured that we would because we're getting like um these nice little snippets of it and we're seeing like you know schemes and stuff being initiated and i feel like these there's some political maneuvering is going to start going on behind the scenes well the reason why his the uh eris's grandfather gets executed in the first place isn't just because he was blamed for it. The reason he was blamed, right, is because that noble that wanted to uh, kidnap Eris in the beginning, that's mm-hmm. the noble that set up Eris's grandfather because he was trying his best to help everyone out, which in turn didn't help anyone out because, you know, you're spread too thin. And instead of helping focusing on trying to save, like, the small, like the stronger people, like the nobles and stuff and their families, he was trying to yeah. help save everyone and help find his family, right? And... That made it so the people were not happy with what was happening, and that noble that originally wanted to buy Eris, his plan was to, like, kill the grandfather and then take over and marry Eris, <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, I, and again, you're right. I think with more time and, and more, you know, um, screen time given to the grandfather, I feel like this could have been a way more impactful scene. As it stands, though, really the only thing you think, uh, or at least that I thought as a, as a watcher of the anime, solely an anime watcher, was um, that Eris is going to be pissed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, her fucking short temper is going to flare up and she's probably going to destroy the entire kingdom. Who knows? Yeah. Um, then after all this, uh, we find out that Rudy and his party are going to be forced to stay in Doldia Village for the next three months due to it being the rainy season and things just don't go in or out uh, during the rainy season. So they're pretty much holed up there for you know the next 90 days or, or so until the rainy season ends. Um, this provides a lot of chance for some character building with Eris. Uh, we get to see her take on somewhat of a, a mentor role for uh some of the beast children and that was cool not it wasn't just cool man so again the side characters and their character development really make it great right so Ares, as we remember in the very beginning was you know your haughty ojo chan didn't want to fucking study didn't want to do this didn't want to do that right pretty much your typical sundere yeah your typical sundere like spoiled princess and here we are i don't know how much time has passed since the beginning this started I don't know, a year and a half, right? Something like uh, that. You mean since the mana disaster? Since Eris 
first got introduced to Rudy. Oh, uh, at least three or four years. Yeah, it's been a while. But her growth as a character, like, she's no longer... She's still a little bit haughty and, like, hot-headed and stuff. But she's actually taking an active role in trying to teach them, like, their own language. And that's that's unheard of. It's Eris. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I love these uh, these couple episodes that we spend in Doldia Village, not only because I thought that it, it was great character building for Eris, um, but also we get a little bit of backstory for a couple of characters uh, as well. We learned that this is the village that Ghislaine was born into, um, and she was not thought of very highly when she lived here. Um <laughs> uh. And so she was basically sent off and told to fuck off. And and I find it funny that um, one of the people that they're staying with, who ends up being uh, Ghislaine's brother, uh, thinks that she never made anything of herself because he never actually bothered to, to get in touch with her or stay in touch with her. It's like he just assumed that she, you know, like lives her life in a ditch somewhere. Yeah, so the thing is, Ghislaine was also, just like her brother, the village chief, they were supposed to protect the sacred beast, but Ghislaine was lazy. She didn't want to, like, uh, learn how to fight and stuff, like, properly train with the sword. And because of that, they had a falling out because she's like, I kind of just want to live my life like a free person, right? And obviously we know the Ghislaine that we know is not the version that he knows, the village chief knows. And it's pretty crazy to see a little bit of her, like, this is how she used to be versus this is how she is now. Like, she's actively taking a role in trying to learn math and reading. She actually learned magic. Like, it's crazy. And again, this is a yeah. more flavor text for the little world, for all the side characters. and It's beautiful. Beautiful thing. Uh, there's there's a there's a conversation that happens in this uh, in this episode between uh, is guess is that how you say his name? The not the village chief, but the Ghislaine's brother. I have zero idea how to pronounce it. I think it's I think it's pronounced guess. It's it's spelled G Y E S. So I'm assuming that's how it's meant to be pronounced. Um, but anyway, uh, he's having a conversation with with Rudy um, about you know is that really what she's like? You know, talking about Ghislaine. He's like, is that really what she's like? Like, I, I, I just can't imagine that. And and Rudy, in two simple words, sums up the entire theme of Michelle Gutense. People change. Yeah. <laughs> and it's such a I mean it's such a simple thing to say, but it, it hits him so hard. He can't imagine that this person that he grew up with and he thought that he knew is someone so different now that she's grown up. Well, cuz again, she's she's a wild child, didn't want to do shit. Mm. Fucks off so much that she gets kicked out of the fucking village. I like how when Rudy starts explaining all the stuff about um Ghislaine, their immediate reaction is like, "You fucking liar." <laughs> You lie as you breathe. Uh, but yeah, that's that's pretty much the um, what happens in uh, in Doldia Village. Um, we get some nice other scenes with with Eris and, and the kids as well. Um, and also, like when the rainy season ends and they actually do go off, we see Keys, who apparently was still locked up for some reason. Um, he actually just jumps into the wagon with them. <laughs> It's never explained why he was actually in the uh, in the jail cell, was it? Uh, he's just kind of so Geese is kind of just a traveling adventurer, and apparently he was uh he tried to cheat some beast men at like a dice game or something. And oh yeah yeah yeah, I remember that now. Yeah, it was a dice game. Why did they keep him locked up though? After he helped them liberate their own village, I don't understand. I don't know. That's not very explained very much. It's kind of just a thing. <laughs> But anyway, they continue their journey, and they are going to the capital city of uh, Milis, which is Milishion. Um, when they get there, Geese parts ways with the group. And I'm when that happened, I was immediately wondering, like, who is this guy? I feel like there's going to be more to this down the road. And there was. Yeah, he, and he says something like, hey, once you get to Milishion, maybe you should head to the tavern at this time. Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. like, who the fuck are you, Geese? <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know, for when I when he first said that, my immediate reaction was, "This is the man god manifesting in the real world." Right. It seems like he's an apostle of the man god or something. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, that was my that was my initial reaction, and I'm still convinced that maybe he does have some connection in some you know strange way with the man god. Maybe in the same way that Rudy does, where he just tells him to do certain things and he does it, and shit happens. Um. 
But once they actually get there and they find a room, uh, Rudy tells his party, hey, we're going to have a day off. And then they all go do their separate things. And Rudy notices what appears to be a kidnapping. And, of course, you know, being Rudy, he's going to go help this this person. Uh, I also like that he has to talk himself into helping this, this kidnapped person as well. Um, but he does it. And the kidnappers are, in fact, led by his father, Paul. Um, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Who would have guessed? Uh, actually, I wouldn't have guessed, dude. That was actually kind of a shocking thing to me when he when he shows up and he's Paul. Yeah, like, why is Paul part of this bandit group now? What the fuck? Yeah. Um, but then they... Uh, th- there is actually a small fight that takes place, which, again, is very, very well animated. Um, but they end up going to the local inn or tavern or whatever you want to call it. Um, and Paul explains to Rudy that uh, their home village was caught in the same mana disaster that they were. Um, and, you know, people were teleported all over the place. And he spent the last year and a half trying to track down the missing uh, village members and uh, his own family. Okay, well, prior to that, Rudy's going off about what's happened since he was teleported with Eris and stuff, right? And he's just Yeah, going, he's making it sound like a grand adventure. Yeah, he's just having, like, a, a ball of the time, like, oh, my God, you won't believe what the fuck we did, man. We went to the Demon Continent, and that shit was crazy. Like, we met this guy, he helped us out, but also, like, he's hella scary, and I'm trying to clear his name, and also, like, this crazy shit. So, he doesn't know that what happened at home was, like, or the man of disaster happened everywhere. Like, that was never, um, we, I guess it, it was never implied or anything, right? It, we assume that the mana disaster only happened where um eris's family was like whatever i fucking forget the kingdom name but we assume roa roa fitaroa yeah i mean the 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 region is called fitaroa but the city itself is called roa yeah so we assume that the mana disaster only happened in fitaroa but it actually happened all over the world Mm -hmm. and paul simultaneously yeah and, and paul is like why the fuck were you playing around like what's wrong with you must be fucking nice huh you got to finally be on a play date with your little miss like what the fuck and yeah. like it's super fucked up to say right like you're you finally meet your son after how many fucking years after your family was like torn apart and the first thing you say is like the first thing you do is yell at him for fucking spending his time surviving like you didn't understand his point of view and obviously cuz Paul's been through a lot right cuz we don't know what happened to Paul all we know that the village got caught up in it too and he hasn't seen anyone in the family either right so this is a very... We also see that he started very heavily drinking. Yeah, he's obviously, like, a fucking shell of his former self because he's all fucked up now, stubby beard and messy, right? And yeah, this is one of the... This is, like, kind of the main focal theme, I would say, of this, uh, of this second half and the most important thing. Like, Paul's like, why didn't you fucking do anything, Rudy? Like... You're Rudy. You're the genius boy who can fucking do Water King magic or whatever. Like, why didn't you think to write us? Why didn't you think to fucking contact us and try to get back to us as soon as possible? Right? And... Yeah, he asked that question, right? He, he literally asked uh, Rudy that question, like, why didn't you write? And then Rudy has no immediate answer to it. Like, there's, a, there's like, at least five seconds of silence where he looks down and he, he has no answer to this question besides, I didn't think about it. Yeah, and it's because Rudy himself is, he was scared, but at the same time, it was like a game to him, right? It, it was an adventure. Because it was something new, and it was like, well, that's crazy. I finally, I'm isekai in a world, but he was in a peaceful village, but now he's actually, like, shit hit the fan, and he's got to survive and, you know, learn, relearn his RPG skills and whatnot. And Mm -hmm. for him, he didn't really take it seriously, because he didn't think that, because they were able to survive relatively easy, because they ran into uh, Rougerd, and obviously Eris is pretty strong of a sword fighter, too, that it's, it wasn't too big of a deal. And he he legitimately did not think about it, because yeah. why would he, right? <laughs> exactly. And this this ends up triggering a big fight, like an actual physical fight between Rudy and Paul. Um, yeah, and Rudy again, beats kind of sh- fucked up. <laughs> beat, Rudy, first of all, Rudy beats the shit out of Paul, man. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, again, kind of a fucked up thing to do when you're a father and you meet your son after being away for so long, and then you just get into a big fight. It just kind of shows how far that Paul has fallen because. 
the you know Paul beforehand before all this happened probably wouldn't have done anything like this. I mean, he may have asked a silly question like why didn't you write, but it wouldn't have escalated into a big physical fight. Yeah, so Paul slugs Rudy because he's like cuz Rudy starts getting mouthy, right? Cuz Rudy is like, "Why are you blaming me for all of this, Paul?" Like, look at this you. Child must needs be, to be put in this place. Yeah, he's like, it must be fucking nice to be. You're thinking about looking for mom. Why are you surrounded by beautiful women then? You fucking philanderer. Like, you're gonna cheat on mom again. Like, he brings up old wounds and it fucking stings. And that's why yeah. Paul fucking slugs him. Yeah. Uh, and then the the fight is interrupted by Norn, uh, Rudy's sister, uh, coming in and stopping the fight. Which, um, God, Norn is cute. <laughs> eh, I don't like her. Bless. Wow, fuck you. <laughs> Listen, there's reasons I don't like her. You'll find out later. Um, and this triggers uh, a bunch of flashbacks to Rudy's uh, past life. And he just, uh, again, like he did in his past life, runs away from his problems instead of meeting them head on. Um, we also find out that Geese is actually a member of Paul's party. We see him uh, talking to Paul and saying, hey, Paul, you really shouldn't just, uh, you know, run away from this and, and let it happen. You should, you know, sit down, talk to your son, have a, have a heart to heart, you know? Yeah. And then Paul's like, him. what are you talking about? Have a heart to heart. Rudy's like way more mature than I am. Even when he was a kid, he was a genius, this and that. Right. And then geese is like, yeah. are you fucking stupid? He's a kid, man. <laughs> and even though we, as the viewer know that Rudy is, yes, he, he's physically a child, but he mentally, he's older than Paul. You got to understand that Rudy's, emotional growth stopped when he was a neat right when he reclused from society back in high school right in high school yeah so he's actually not too mature he's as mature as a teenager would be so that's something that uh i guess some people would probably not think about and be like oh what the fuck's wrong with rudy why didn't he do that yeah anyway point is because he hasn't actually grown as a person in his previous life even though he is uh, his older life, he's, he was physically older than Paul. Emotionally and mentally, he's not that old. He's a teenager at the most, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, it, I think that some people who watch this and, and come away with a negative opinion of Rudy, uh, viewers, I mean, uh, that's something they don't understand as well. Like, the reason he acts the way he acts sometimes is because he, when even in his old life, he was, d- despite being middle-aged, was never really emotionally mature. Yeah, he ran away from his problems for like 20 years until he died. So Yeah, he literally ignored his own parents' funeral. He had to jerk off to lolly porn. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, and then they actually do. Paul and Rudy have that, that father-son heart-to-heart. Um, and I, I don't know what it was for you, but for me, that was actually kind of a really powerful scene. Oh, because I fucking cried, man. So me too. Let me listen, explain. Listen. So when I read no, this... Go go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so when I, when I read this in the web novel, I cried. Because I was just like... Because it's so much emotional like baggage that Rudy has with this and with Paul. And it's a very moving scene, right? Where Rudy mm-hmm. decides to like... He wants to be a better person. His entire point of trying to come to this world... Or his entire raison d'etre was to become a better person in this world to actually like have a second shot and it was just great emotional growth for rudy to like get all fucked up over this and realize like he treated his same his parents the same way where when something bad happened he like just ran away from everything and he made them pay for it and just like when his parents died in uh the old world he blamed them he was like fucking parents how could you fucking die at the same time you're not gonna fucking leave me any money like, what's wrong with you? And then you're like, what a piece of fucking shit. You little. So it's a big growth to that. And the way that Rudy feels as a person and when he thinks about how he treated his prior parents and like he looks at Paul now and he's like, Paul's not even he's younger than I am. And look at how far he's come. Like he has a kid and he's been trying his best and he's decrepit and stuff, you know, like, oh, it's all fucked up. And uh, it is uh, the mo- the most important part was so when they first meet up again, right? Paul's trying to like apologize and stuff, and Rudy's just like he doesn't even want to look at Paul in the fucking face, right? He's just like staring at the fucking table, not looking at Paul, and just saying whatever. And then the barkeeper is like, you know, son, if you're gonna be talking to your father, maybe you should look at him in the fucking face. And then you look up, and Paul's like all fucked up in the face because he's like 
he's emotionally torn. It was just I'm tearing up thinking about it. It's such an impactful scene. Oh my god. And yeah. <laughs> oh god. It, well, it was it was impactful for me because it reminded me personally of a very similar heart to heart I had with my own father when he and I had a falling out when I was a teenager. Yeah, and obviously like that's what they were going for because again the whole idea behind this anime was like rebuilding yourself as a person and becoming who you want to be and a better person in general and this is just oh it's such a good and powerful scene and it's very emotional like again i cried when i read it in the web novel i cried when i read it in the manga i fucking cried when i saw it in the anime i was like (laughs) god damn it it's gotten to be three for three it is it is a very powerful scene and it's one of the reasons i just i love the writing in this because it gets to the heart of like actual human issues like this like the 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 kind of falling outs that fathers and sons can have and it, the proper way to reconcile your differences isn't through that fighting isn't through the isn't through the uh you know shouting at each other it's like recognizing that you're actual fucking people that are gonna make mistakes and that's okay yeah for me this was the this would be the climax of the uh, second part like everything has been finally or i i would say of the of the <laughs> of the first season as a whole. This is the climax of the arc because everything has been culminating to this, right? We have Rudy in the beginning, mm-hmm. training and growing as a person slowly, right? With his first steps outside the village verse and then his uh being uncomfortable and having to live with strangers and then teaching her and having to put up with that abuse. Everything has been culminating to this, right? A testament yep. to his character because it, yep. he he could have ran away. And no one would have really blamed him. Like, your father is a piece of shit that slugged you when you came back and blamed you for everything. Like, for you not trying hard enough. And it's like, oh, uh, God, that was a good scene, too, with Geese, where Geese explains, like, you weren't born on the demon continent, were you? Like, the demon continent is fucking harsh to live in, even for demons. Like, what makes you think an eight-year-old boy would be able to survive there? Yeah, and Geese is making him confront his own ignorance to that, too. And it's just, it's done so well. And, side note, man... Paul's party members are such great people, like Geese. Like, we didn't know too much about Geese, but we see that he's a very, like, flippant, lackadaisical guy, just kind of does whatever. But he's also emotionally very strong, right? And he's there for Paul, and he helped Paul find his son. (laughs) Well, it's like when you first meet him, right, in, in the, the, the Doldia village, he comes off as this fucking moron. But then you realize, wait, this guy actually knows what he's talking about, and he actually is emotionally a very strong, capable person. Well, yeah, because, like, Geese was like, boss, man, why did you leave me in the prison? He was like, oh, I completely <laughs> forgot you were even there, Geese. And it's like, wait, Oops. how did you get out? And he was like, oh, I just got tired of being in there, so I decided to leave. And it's like, wait a second. <laughs> just like Rudy could have left at any time. Geese could have left at any time. Yeah. Um, but after this this great bit of, of writing here, uh, we Rudy reveals uh, to his father that he's going to start looking for the rest of his family after he's able to um, escort Eris home. And then this is where Paul lets him know, like, what happened to the, um, the gray rat? Yeah, the gray rat family over in um, Fitaroa. Like, yeah, your town's gone. And also you're you don't own the dukedom or anything anymore. So unfortunate. And also uh, this guy's dead and this guy's dead. And, you know, Eris is going to be really pissed. Yeah. Oh, and then I, I Rudy makes a conscious effort to not mention any of that. Well, yeah, because <laughs> you don't want to tell her that before you get there. No. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and Geese also says that he's going to go off and search for the rest of Paul's family as well. So I feel like this won't be the last time uh, we see Geese in the story. I feel like that's going to come back at some point. Um, but then we get something that I can only describe as, as a breather episode, although I don't know breather from, I guess, emotional lows. <laughs> um um, where we get an episode that's devoted almost entirely to Roxy going back to see her family. I love this episode, by the way. And again, we're... Yes, it's a breather episode because holy fuck, that was there was a lot of lows in the last like fucking episode. So this is kind of the uh, comic relief that comes right after that because we can't just constantly be sad the entire time. Doesn't make for great comic relief. That's not very funny. <laughs> it's kind of sad. Like what when Roxy goes back home, it's something that we learn about her is that like her. Well, we knew it, we kind of knew it before, uh, but Roxy, the 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 people that Roxy comes from, they're telepathic, but she can't communicate through telepathy, 
And I love how that's visualized in the show as well, where all she hears are like these crackles and like pops um, when people try to communicate with her telepathically. Yeah, and it has something to do with uh, her magic is different. So a curse of hers is that she actually is pretty strong. Uh, she's very gifted and has a lot of mana, but because of that, mm-hmm. her internal mana like doesn't allow external mana to come inside which is why she can't uh the telepathy doesn't work because how it works is that their race sends mana to each other and that they can talk through the mana well R- yeah. roxy's mana is too strong so she can't do that which is super crazy yeah. um and, and she, it's been this way ever since she was you know a child um uh, and i like that flashback that we get to her childhood where uh people are trying to talk to her uh telepathically inside the village and they're just staring at her like she's a fucking moron um and they, they they don't realize that that she can't understand what they're saying to her um and she had goes back to her parents and she feels like that she's bad for some reason because people won't talk to her even though they're trying to well no she also feels bad because she just left she straight up just left right and mm-hmm. one of the big things like she looks at the shelf and she sees that First of all, Roxy's parents are fucking super young looking. <laughs> like yeah. when you... everyone in this village is super young looking, despite their age. I mean, it's it's part of their their race, like their race. They always look young. Yeah, but yeah. So Ru- uh, Rudy, Roxy looks at the shelf and she sees like her old toys and stuff when she was a little kid, just still there. And their parents obviously, her parents obviously like miss her and stuff. And it, yeah. just a little bit nice backstory to Roxy and like why she's even exploring and you get to learn a little bit about her village. Yeah. I love the, the, the little bit that precedes this too. So she goes back to the village, she meets her parents and of course they're shocked and surprised to see her. They're giving her a hug, you know, exchanging pleasantries and, and rock is like, yeah, I'll stay for a little while, but then I got to go. And then their, their, her parents who look like they're preparing dinner or something, they start communicating telepathically to each other. And Roxy hears that those popping noises go off. And she's like, it almost reminds her of why she left. And it's like, all right, I got to go. <laughs> and then that's when she sees the, that's when she sees the toys there. Yeah. And it's so sad. Like they're like, please at least visit us in the next 10 years. You know, and it's just like Roxy, Roxy, come on. Don't do this to your yeah. parents. Like, what are you doing, uh, Yeah, girl? I, I love come this on. episode, not only because we got a, a, a great deal of backstory about Roxy, who is a character that I fucking love. Um, it was some nice character development for her as well, I think. Um, sort of making up with her parents a little bit, you know, kind of trying to make up a little bit for lost time. Um, and then at the end of this, we, we see her meet up with her party again. Um, and they're still searching the demon continent for Rudy, be it but he's not going to be there because they don't know that he's left. Uh, so then we get to the next episode, which takes place uh, in the kingdom of Shirone? Shirone? Shirone, I don't know. <laughs> my, 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 Sharona. My, Sharona. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought when I heard it the first time, too. Um, and Rudy has another encounter with the man god. Um, this dude sus as hell at this point. Uh, but he gives him very specific instructions on how to reunite uh, with uh, Lilia and Aisha. Although he doesn't, he doesn't um, at first say that it's going to be Lily. He just shows him Aisha, who is his half sister, um, and so he gives him very, very specific instructions. You have to send a letter, uh, you know, asking for rocks, asking for someone that you know at the palace. Well, the only person he knows is that this palace was supposed to be Roxy, who is teaching the prince uh, as an instructor, uh, and so that's what he does. He sends a letter uh, to the palace, and he goes, you know, I don't never really explained why he's kind of walking around seeing stuff but maybe he's just waiting for a response to come back um but he's being uh followed by aisha and then he he thinks he's being followed by someone sinister so he's trying to like dodge and weave around them um and in the in the uh in the pursuit of the or trying to get away from his pursuer he ends up causing the very thing that the man god showed him in the vision beforehand the reason he was wandering around the city was because he remembered the vision that the man god showed him. So he was trying to find mm. that. He was like, what am I? He was wandering mm. around aimlessly yes, right. because of that. That's yes, right. That's right. Uh, yeah, he was trying to find the alleyway or whatever that the vision itself was taking place in. Not knowing that him running away from what he thought was a pursuer was going to lead him to the said alleyway. Yeah, the man god works in mysterious ways. 
Exactly. This is why he's hella sus. Can we really trust him? Is he actually doing this for a good purpose? Who knows? But Who every knows? single thing he's done has helped Rudy survive, hasn't he? So far. So far. But then after all this happens, we, I mean, he meets Aisha, um, and then a whole bunch of stuff happens with her uh, um, where he does. Oh, and the man God tells uh, him not to reveal who he actually is to her. Um, so he comes up with an elaborate, uh, or not so elaborate, really, alias. Yeah, Rudy Jard or something. Rud- Rud- <laughs> Jard. And uh, while he's got Aisha in his care, uh, more or less, he gets summoned to um, the palace, thinking that it is, you know, it's Roxy who has summoned him to the palace. And uh, we find out that, no, it was actually the prince that Roxy was training, Pax. He set a trap for Rudy because he wants to lure Roxy back to be with him because he's a sexual harasser. Yeah, Prince Pax is a little piece of shit. He's a little turd. And he, uh, I Have you seen him? He's not little. He's fat. Yeah, well, I mean... He's just a little, he's a piece of shit. <laughs> and he drove Roxy away with his sexual harassment. But that's not an important bit. The important bit is that for whatever reason, he's like, well, if I have your favorite pupil here, Roxy's going to come back to me. And it's like, bro, Roxy doesn't even know he fucking exists. Like, here, like, what the fuck's wrong with you? How, how are you going to contact Roxy? You don't even know where she is. Like, this prince is really dumb. Yeah, I, I like how, he, like, Rudy even says that to him. And he's like, well, it'll just work out. Yeah, like, uh, shut up. Stay in the dungeon. <laughs> but because of this, though, we meet our next kind of new recurring character. Kind of. I don't know. You, We may see him later. No, we're going to see him later. I'm, he's going to be part of the next arc. But his, uh, it's Prince, the third Prince, Zenoba. And we learn a little bit about the world again, that he's someone that's called a, a gifted child. So in this mm-hmm. world, some people are born with blessings. On top of like, so not only can you just learn skills and magic and stuff like that, and you can train and get better, right? You There's also weird things in the world called blessings. So Zenoba is like the, he has the blessing of strength. And basically he's super powerful. He's also voiced by, um, oh my God, Sagita. <laughs> He's voiced yes, by Sagita. And I was just like, oh, that's. And all, and all his <laughs> Sagita-ness. And all his Sagita-ness. Yeah, so uh, the third Prince Zenoba is like, so we were going through your possessions, and I found this, like, sculpture. And he's like, where did you get this sculpture? And Rudy's like, oh, I, I picked it up in the demon continent. I don't know what it is. And Zenoba's like, oh, is that so? What a shame. Because I fucking love figures. You see you see this Roxy figure? Look how crafty it is, this and that, you know? And then, like, uh, Rudy's weeb side comes out, and he's like, How dare you do that to my figure? It was crafted perfectly before. Did you not notice how the mole there represented? And it was just so fucking funny. <laughs> like, they have a whole yeah, total I, I weeb out moment. I love the way this character is introduced <laughs> so much. Also, I, I think this is, a, this is a great call to all the figure makers out there, you should really be making these figures that Rudy is making in the show. Just saying. <laughs> I mean, that'd be kind of cool, but uh, I don't know. I don't know who owns the IPs to... Who, I don't know who who signed the contract and who owns their merchandising. I have zero idea. I know there are some uh, Mashoko Tensei uh, figures that are already out there, either uh, to order or pre-order at this point. Um, I don't know if any of them have actually been based on the figures that rudy himself has made in the show oh, no. although i think that would be a great thing to have if uh, if anyone out there is listening and you know no, like the very first figure i remember was an heiress figure that came out back in the day mm-hmm. with the uh light novels launch but yeah so <laughs> he somehow gets he tells zenoba well i can teach you how to make all this stuff however your brother pax has prisoned me and so then zenoba's like all right fucking I'll, I'll fix this so he goes and grabs pax and like is about to rip pax's arm off <laughs> he's like you gonna let him go pax's like no so is he gonna let him go i'm gonna rip your fucking arm out like holy fuck yeah <laughs> that was great i i love that entire sequence like it seems almost like a deus ex machina but boy was it fun to watch uh but yeah rudy gets freed uh, after after this, and we have the reunion with uh, Lilia and Aisha, and uh, we get the uh, the holy relic back. Rudy gets his, the holy relic back, <laughs> uh, and he finally gets the necklace that Selfie made for him for his tenth birthday that uh, Selfie was never able to give him. That was a that was a nice little touch to put in there too. I like that. Well, yeah, because Selfie is still around, guys. Yeah, I mean, we haven't seen Sylvie ever since the uh, the mana disaster, really. Um, we, we, you know, 
Rudy's talked about Sylphie, but we haven't really seen any evidence that Sylphie is is alive or even missing for that matter. We haven't seen her at all. Um, but I like that little reunion they have uh, with Lilia and, and Rudy. Um, how much how much respect that Lilia has for Rudy despite his you know proclivities to pervertedness. Yeah, like Lilia, because when she she talked a little bit about it before, but basically she she hates how he's like a you know he was he's a perverted old man on the inside. He's like this is not he's a creepy baby. Babies don't act mm-hmm. like this. But then she starts liking Rudy once he uh, tried to save Lilia from getting kicked out, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then Lilia and Aisha are arranged to be sent uh, back home. Um... So that that's good. We know that there's there's a little bit of closure there. Hopefully, um, again, I don't think we'll be seeing the last of these characters. I think uh, another season we'll be seeing them again in some capacity. Um, but then we move on from that, as uh, as Rudy and company still continue back to their home village. We have the encounter with Orsted, which holy fuck was that fight fun to watch? Oh yeah, like I was super excited for this. I. My problem with this episode was that they showed the ending at the beginning, right? Like, yes. so it cuts open with, like, Rudy's fucking got a hole in his chest and Orsted's hand and is bleeding out severely. Yeah, it's like, oh, God, Rudy died, right? And I hate I hate stuff like that because it's like, obviously, he's not fucking dead. Dude, it's not the end of the episode yet. He's obviously not fucking dead. It's not dead. the end of the episode. It's not the end of the season. Yeah, like, get out of here with that shit. I hate that. So we all know he's not actually dead, but he got fucking fucked up, right? And I loved Orsted and how they portrayed him because he is the uh he's the dragon god and he is just traveling around the world and he has curses afflicted on him right from the man god but Mm -hmm. it was pretty crazy because so when they first encounter orsted like everyone reacts to orsted right away like um rujard eris and rujard are frozen stiff in their in their tracks yeah they're like like, they can't move because because of the curse on orsted his mask there's a he has the uh mask of the hated or whatever that makes it so everyone fucking fears him by just even looking at him. And mm-hmm. Rudy's just like, da, da, da. oh, what's wrong, guys? Oh, hey, travelers. Oh, that's weird. And they walk past, and they're like, wait a second. I know you two, but who are you? And he's like, oh, me? I'm Rudy. Nice to meet you. And he's like, huh, that's weird. Paul's son? Paul doesn't have a son. He has two daughters. And Rudy's like, huh, that's weird. And then they're like, all right, well, see you later. And he's like, yeah, see ya. And then he turns around. And then Orsted's like, oh, by the way, do you know the man god? Because at this point, no one has no ever talks about the man god, right? No one in any religion. So they've talked about uh, different gods that they have in the world, but they don't have the man god. Because they have, like, the battle god, the north god, stuff like that. But So <laughs> so then fucking Rudy turns around, oh, yeah, I know the man god. <laughs> and then immediately, boom. And then immediately Orsted is, like, going to go fucking kill him. <laughs> it's like, wait, what? <laughs> It turns out that Orsted doesn't like the man god. And for, I don't know why Rudy would ever fucking like, in this world that you live in, there is no mention of the man god, right? And they kind of skip this a little bit because Rudy does prod a little bit about the man god because he's like, who is the man god and why does he keep trying to fucking get me to do stuff? Like, what is this guy? You know, and I don't hear anything about the man god when they talk about the, I think it's seven or the eight gods or something. Like, in the main religion, no one talks about the man yeah, god. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just some unknown god. So he's like, that's weird that this god is talking to me and telling me how to do things. Like, oh, w- weird, right? Because they know about the dragon god. They know about the um, magic god. I don't remember all the gods, but they know about every other god. And <laughs> So in what fucking, like, situation would you just say, oh, yeah, I know the man god? <laughs> what is wrong <laughs> with you? Fucking idiot, Rudy. And that's why you get a fucking hole pierced in your chest. Yeah, but Rudy does end up, quote unquote, dying. Um, and he meets the man god again. Um, and and as, as you mentioned, he reveals to Rudy that Orsted is afflicted with multiple curses, um, including one that makes everyone fear him completely irrationally. Uh, but Rudy wasn't affected by it at all. Uh, we also find out in this meeting that the man God for the first time kind of shows us that he is not all knowing because there are things about Orsted that he doesn't know. Oh, he can't see Orsted is what he says. Yeah. So he's not all knowing he's in he, kind that also kind of, uh, implies that he may not be all powerful either. Well, 
He is the man. God. I said, I said implies. I didn't say that it, it meant it. It said it, uh, you know, specifically. I, it kind of implies that he may not be. This ties into a bunch of other stuff, but yeah, Orsid kills Rudy because Rudy knows who the man God is, and, and in this world, no one knows the man God. So Orsid goes, I don't know this person. This person knows the man God. This person is an apostle of the man God. So he fucking just mm-hmm. kills Rudy. Yeah, but then they have that that um, <laughs> they have that. Uh, conversation the man god and rudy again about uh you know <laughs> the value of life and he's i like how he's sitting there in his old body with a hole just in his chest and the way he, the way that they that he greets the man god he's like the man god's like hey how's it going and he's like well i have a hole in my chest <laughs> so that kind of sucks <laughs> <laughs> that kind of sucks <laughs> um but no um so Rudy actually ends up waking up, thinking, I think, uh, uh, you know, originally when he wakes up, the man god actually brought him back to life. But we learn that uh, Orsted's traveling companion, Nana Hoshi, convinced Orsted to use healing magic on him to save his life and spare him. And then they just fucked off. And the immediate question I had was why? I know why, but I'll never I'm tell. I'm sure you do. <laughs> I'm sure you know exactly why, but that left the that left the great question in my heart: is why would you do this? Well, first of all, look at her name, Nana Hoshi, seven stars, <laughs> sus. Yeah, don't I, you I, think? I a little a little sus, a little sus. She has a Japanese name. Huh? Yeah. Weird, right? Mm-hmm. Mm, well, it's a little sus. I don't know what they're talking about there. Um, but yeah, we uh, Rudy also afterwards has a conversation with um, uh, Rougerd, um, and lets him know that his curse on him is gradually fading away. Um, which is cool. Yeah, and then Rougerd cries, and it's like, oh, and, Rougerd, buddy, I feel so bad my, for you. My baby, come here, my baby, come here, my bald little baby. And it was like, because the man god tells him, yeah, so the reason why the the superior curse to uh, Lapless is actually linked to their hair. So him shaving his head actually helped, like, reduce his curse. <laughs> yeah. Which is pretty fucking funny. Um, like, what? It was that simple. Then we get to the last two episodes, which are very heavily emotionally charged. Um, so Rudy finally is able to return to his own uh, home village and to his old home. Um, and it's, it's pretty much burnt out. It's, it's abandoned. It's, it looks like it's, it's very disheveled. Um, and he has a bunch of like flashbacks to his time growing up there in that house. And it's, it's all very sweet. Well, reality finally set in. So at this point, again, we know that supposedly the mana disaster has happened everywhere. Right. But we haven't seen the Mm. extent of the damage. Right. And this kind of justifies Paul's anger. Right. Like to yeah. see all this stuff happen, like holy fuck, Paul went through a lot. So I, yeah. I can't blame we him also, for being pissed off at Rudy when Rudy comes in, fucking, oh yeah, I was having a great adventure. We also know that some some uh, amount of time between a year and a half and two years has passed since the time the Mana disaster happened and the time that um they get back home uh to Rudy's old house. Like it, it it's it's. As far as I can tell, it hasn't been explained, you know, exactly how much time has passed, but somewhere between a year and a half and two years that they've been gone. Um, you also find out that the uh, many of the cities, at least on the central continent, are still kind of reeling from this disaster. Like they haven't, it, and that just kind of makes begs into question for me. Like, how bad is the infrastructure in these places if after almost two years you still can't even get on your feet again? Well, you got to understand that even in this world of magic, the continents are large and they still only travel by like courses and ships. Like how and how would you be able to like, let's say you got instantly teleported to Beijing, right? Mm -hmm. And you didn't know anything about Beijing other than Beijing is where Chinese people live, right? But you didn't even know the city you were in is Beijing, right? How would you get back home? No money. And we're assuming a world that doesn't have cell phones no mail services like that and i didn't speak the language you didn't speak the language so there's mail services right but you don't speak the language and also you live in a country hick town how would you get response back to your town that's actually a great question you don't have an address yeah the way you put it that the, the way you put it there is is yeah i i don't know exactly what i would do so for the poor people in the region it would basically be impossible to reunite and rebuild, right? Because not only do you have to 
you have to t- take care of your own life. Like, you still have to eat. You still have to farm. It's not like they have fucking a uh, emergency response unit to fucking... Because the kingdom, like, the kings and stuff were reeling from this, too. The nobles, obviously, are not going to be handing out stuff left and right. Which is part of why Eris's grandfather got executed. Because he was handing out rations left and right to try to save everyone. But mm-hmm. that pissed off the nobles. Because they're like, what the fuck are you doing? Help me f- save my people first. You're, you're a noble, right? Why are you helping out the peasants? So, that, again, that's one yeah. of the little details that we missed because they skipped it. But, again, it's not too... It, this this entire show of Michoko Tensei is it's not supposed to be about political intrigue. If you want to watch that, go watch Realist Hero or something. So, Or go watch 86. <laughs> it's pretty good. Um... um yeah, and then we also have the uh, the goodbye that Rougerid has. Like he's he's fulfilled what he said he was gonna do. He was gonna stay with them until they got home. He and fulfilled his home. Mandalorian oath. Yes, he fulfilled his Mandalorian oath. This was the way. <laughs> and that he he realizes that they're both strong enough and they don't require his protection anymore. And he he leaves. Uh, that scene where he leaves is is kind of heart wrenching. But again, I feel like he's a character who's. This isn't really goodbye. I feel like he'll he'll come back in some capacity somehow. Well, one road. thing is that uh, he's been traveling around and he's been having um, Rudy basically take all the the talking. Right, he's the front man of the group. He's the the kennel master, as they put it, of the of dead end. Right, so he doesn't have good personal skills. Right, but now that he knows that his curse is almost lifted and thanks to Rudy's efforts of, like, going around being like, yeah, Supards are actually that bad. Uh, this is the story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta take a minute. Just sit right there. The fresh prince of the <laughs> demon continent. <laughs> but, yeah, Rudy's been spreading the word of, like, actually, Laplace is the one who cursed the um, Supard mm-hmm. and made him do all that fucked up shit. It wasn't the Supard race just going crazy. And... He hears this figure of Supards are not scary. So Rougerard realizes that now that he's fulfilled his oath of taking the kids back, because that's what he said originally in the very beginning, I'm going to help you guys get back to your place, and that's it. He realizes that yeah. he himself needs to take on the task now. He can't rely on Rudy forever to do this for him, because part of the whole entire thing is to, if you want to show the world that Supards aren't bad people anymore... What better way than to do it yourself, right? It's growth of character. Exactly. It's great character development, and it's it, it's great to see it kind of come full circle at this point <clears throat> with his character. Um, I, like I said, I really hope this isn't the last we actually see of him uh, because Rougerard is actually really a fun character um, to watch. Um, after the farewell, though, um, we go back to the city of uh, Roa, which we see is mostly still in ruins. A lot of people living in tents outside the city. Um, Eris finally reunites with uh, Ghislaine, which I'm really glad she didn't just up and die. That That's nice. Uh, cat girl titties. Yes. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> um, and uh, she also reunites with their server, Alphonse. Um, Alphonse then just straight up reveals to her uh that there's another member of um <clears throat> well she uh, he reveals to her what Rudy knew all along that her parents were both killed in the teleportation incident and um that her grandfather was executed by the king which at uh, you know predictably makes her very upset um and then Alphonse also says that there's a branch of the Grey Rat family that wants to uh make Eris their concubine nice yeah, because that's not nice. Eris's family basically, um, because her grandfather was executed by the king, and her parents, the ones who should have taken over, are now dead. The Grey Rat family household has like fallen now. Like they, her yeah. specific household no longer has any sway, and the only thing she can do, to, like save face for her family line, is to marry, get married off to that noble. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um... So, you know, Eris needs time to process this. Obviously, this just tells everyone to go the fuck away and leave her alone for a little while. Um, also, everyone except Alphonse seems to be against this. Um, rightfully so, I think. Um, well, because Alphonse explains it like as much as he 
love serving the uh, Grey Rat family, his loyalty is to the kingdom, right? His his loyalty mm-hmm. is to his town, and whatever he'll do whatever it takes to help restore the town first. And that's kind of like what Eris's grandfather was doing anyway, right? So he obviously can't voice his disposition or his opposition to towards marrying Eris off because he's like, well, the nobles would really like it and it would really help the town. So I think yeah. this is... I'm just letting you know this is what would happen, right? Yeah. So you um, can you can kind of call it like a dick move on Alphonse's part because it's like, what the heck, man? Like you were supposed to be a servant of the Grey Rat family and this and that, but it's like, it's not. But the problem is, it's not just the Grey Rat family that was affected. It was everyone. And I think Alphonse yeah. is right. Like as much as it fucking sucks, it's like this is just for the better of everyone in this town. Yeah. Um, we also find out uh, that uh, Sophie has not been found dead. She is still on a list of missing people. Uh, however, her location completely remains unknown at this point. Um, so that gives Rudy a bunch of hope that, hey, she might actually still be out there. She just needs to be found. And then uh, later that night, Eris and Rudy do the dirty. Yeah. <laughs> Finally. So Eris promised that Rudy could do anything to her on his 15th birthday, I believe. I think that was the mm-hmm. original And promise. it was coming up. But, uh, yeah, at this point, Eris is, like, she's emotionally all f- messed up. Like, her, all her family's dead, essentially. The only person she has left from that would be Rudy. Like, that's kind of related mm-hmm. to her because they're, like, second yeah. cousins. First cousins? I think they might you, be first cousins. You could cousins. make the argument that, you know, you, you still have Paul, which is, which who is distantly related to Eris, but that's not quite the same. Yeah, but, like, I meant for in her household where she was growing up. Yeah. So... She wants to become one with Rudy because she she needs to know that emotionally, like she needs to know that she still has someone on her side and that she has a family still. And it's oh, poor heiress. <laughs> poor emotionally fucked up girl. <laughs> um, but no, I, I was I was talking with Natai about this and I really wish he could have joined us for this discussion, although it'd probably be about five hours long at this point. Um that, you know, for a series that never once shied away from showing, like, sex and sexuality for what it really was, the sex scene between Eris and Rudy was quite muted. Because it was more of a symbolic thing as well. Like, there's a lot it of, was. uh, we're seeing the growth of Eris as a person and as she's coming into age to become a woman in this world, right? Because she's, she already turned 15, so she's technically an adult already. And Rudy is now technically becoming an adult as well. And this is yeah, kind he's of on the cusp of his 15th birthday. Yeah, so it's like this is the culmination where they're both becoming adults and they have to deal with things like adults. So this was the one thing that Eris could think of to do before she took on her adult roles because she was like she she didn't freak out and start fucking like fighting people left and right when she found out her parents were dead and her kingdom was gone, you know, and that she has to go go get married. She was calm and no, cool. She's like, just leave me alone for a couple hours. Yeah, she was like, all right just leave me alone but like i'm not gonna freak out like i know i understand that i have duties as someone with royal bloodline or or with um i just need blood. some time by myself to emotionally process what i have been told yeah and it's great growth <laughs> it is um and then like you almost feel like she comes and does that with rudy just to feel something besides despair <laughs> kind of it's more of her confronting her own feelings right of um inac- mm. inadequacy because mm-hmm. she's always felt like I can do whatever I want. I can get away with it because grandpa loves me. Right. But then yeah. she slowly transforms into like a girl who gets challenged. And she's like, wait, I can do that. Fuck you. I can do that. And then she again grows as a person and realizes that you can't kind of just be selfish all the time. That'll lead to people fucking yeah. dying. And yeah. if you were selfish at this point, you're going to forsake everyone in your town the town that your family promised to protect. Yeah. So, um, but then after, after all that happens, Rudy wakes up the next morning and I love the way he wakes up. He just greets the day and you, you don't even hear it from Rudy's, uh, uh, voice. You actually hear it from the voice of his old self. It's like, hello everyone. I'm greeting the day. <laughs> yeah. Cause you know, it's like, I've been there, man. I know exactly the feeling that you're having right he now. He dropped his V card. Finally, dude, it's been like 50 <laughs> or yeah, he's like 40-something years. I uh, I remember when that happened to me, and I felt the exact same way you did, Rudy. 
Um, but then he wakes up to find out that in the middle of the night, uh, uh, Eris had left with Ghislaine and, uh, no one will tell him where, where she has gone. Big oof. I've been there too, Rudy. <laughs> yeah. He gets, he straight up gets ghosted. Yeah. Um, and his reaction to it, like where he just kind of walks off by himself and just starts crying. Ooh, ooh. Ah, that hit home. I know what rejection like that feels like. Yeah, and he slips into depression, and he regresses back into his old ways. Like, he's just sitting there thinking about his past life, and we get flashbacks of his old life and stuff and see, like, a little bit more story about, like, how, why is he how he is, right? He tried mm-hmm. to stand up to bullies. He got bullied, and then everyone made fun of him, and he didn't want to be out there anymore. And he started, like, at the beginning, he was like, it's okay. Tomorrow I can take that first step outside and I can, I can do it, you know, and it just mm-hmm. like regresses and he just keeps, it keeps, time just keeps passing, right? Where he keeps slipping away further and further away from that goal of like, I can make it, I can step outside to eventually where he says, why do I need to go outside? It's everyone's fault. Like it, I didn't do anything wrong, you know? And it's like, it's so, it's heartbreaking. Because this entire time, he's done so well since his new life, where he's overcome challenges, he's tackled all the insecurities he had prior to himself about, like, going outside, saying hello to people, meeting new people, studying hard, actually trying to do something with your fucking life, to going back to his, like, fuck it, life's not worth living anymore, I'm just gonna stay in this tent all day, and... Unfortunately for him, though, reality kind of slaps him in the face, because Alphonse comes in, and it's like... It's implied that Rudy's been kind of in a depression for, like, a week or something in this tent. Like, he doesn't... He's wasting food. He's just, like, sitting there on his bed. And Alphonse is like, so... I understand that you're upset, but we would really be glad if you could give us this tent. Because there's literally hundreds of people that need a fucking tent. And also, they wouldn't waste the fucking food like you're wasting right now, you depressed little shit. So... (laughs) And it's a slap of reality because, again, the world doesn't revolve around Rudy. The world rotates still, and he's going through all his memories, and he's he's trying to find, like, a reason to live. And he actually finally flashes back to uh, his mom, Zenith. So he felt like the biggest piece of shit because despite what we saw in the first episode slash second episode where he, like, is – jerking off to lolly porn and just is mad at his parents for being dead we also see a flashback of his parents like trying to care for them in his own ways right where they're like well we left you food we're gonna go talk to the school we're gonna get those fucking kids and their parents in trouble for doing this you know and Mm -hmm. it's implied and they've been taking care of him since he was a teenager well over 20 years until they die so they're not terrible people his parents and he felt terrible that he treated them like that especially since He's in this new world, and he has a new lease on life, and he realizes that his parents, his new parents, Zenith and uh, Paul, gave him a second shot, and they did nothing but love him, and it's very strong and emotional feeling, because it's like, you know, I was a little shit too once, and I I feel bad about how I treated my parents too when I was a little shit. Me too. Oh, man, what the fuck was wrong with me? And, um... it's what motivates him finally to like take the next step because in this world he said he was going to change and he has changed he's come so far and it's finally his turn to give back and he realizes like his mom's still missing like as fucked up as he is right now he still has a goal that he should probably reach before he fucking you know breaks down again and that's save his mom yeah um and sylvia's still out there too um, I also like that we kind of end on um, a bunch of vignettes that go that show what some of the other characters that they've met on their journey are doing. In the meantime, we I, we see um, we see Eris training to become even stronger um, with with Ghislaine. We see uh, Rougier going off and you know fighting people are fighting beasts on his own for other people and then you know uh, trying to make the the name of the super like you know better. And he, he, he's surprised that the people he helps um, aren't immediately scared and run away when he, you know, shows them who he is. Or when he tells them he's a superhero. Yeah. Um, then we see Roxy um, encounter the was it Demon Emperor. Yeah. Is, is it Demon Emperor? Yeah, Demon Emperor. Um, 
uh, <laughs> Kishirika, um, and <laughs> she uses uh, her demon eye or one of her demon eyes to uh, locate Zenith um, and tells Roxy that she's in the labyrinth city of Rapan on the, uh, I'm going to mispronounce this, Begarit? Begarit? Uh, continent um, and so that's obviously where the story is progressing because we see Roxy and her party head off there we also see Rudy and that symbolism at the, at the near the very end where you see Rudy uh, passing his old self um, in the flashback like that the symbolism of that is like okay I, I, I like where this is going like you finally maybe learned a lesson yeah occasionally you're going to come up against this um um, temptation to go back to how you were, but ultimately you're going to realize that the good thing to do is overcome how you used to be and just move forward. Don't stray, <laughs> please. Um, and that's kind of how it ends. And then we get an after credit scene, which is obviously, uh, you know, bait for what comes next. Um, we see Sylphie trying to convince this group of people to recruit Rudy into the ranks, and that's pretty much how the season ends. Yeah, so this has to do with the next arc, and uh, it's like, who are these people, right? Why do they? Mm-hmm. Why is Sylphie with them? Um, well, it's implied that it's Sylphie. It's never actually stated. Does she? Does she say Sylphie? I don't remember. No, but it, it looks like Sylphie. It, it sounds like Sylphie. I'm just going to go with it. It's Sylphie. How dare you? This is Fitz Senpai, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit spoiler right there, but um, yeah. Uh, I I don't know if a season two has been announced yet, but... It hasn't been announced yet, but the studio that was formed to make this anime studio bind has announced that they want to do a complete adaptation of this Um uh, of Mashoku Tensei. So, I uh, listen. I don't need an announcement. Take your time. I don't don't rush this, please. Um, because as good as it is, and this is good, like this, t- ten out of ten. That I, I'll spoil it right now. That's my fucking score for Mashoku Tensei as a whole. Ten out of ten. Um, a- as good as as this is, I am willing to wait for more quality writing, more quality animation, like we got with the uh, with this first season. See. I have a bunch of problems with it, right? <laughs> oh, Lord. Here we go. I have a bunch of problems with it because the source material is very s- strongly written well. Like, it's written very well, and they have strongly stuck to it, right? To the anime adaptation, which is great. However, at the same time, they are missing a lot of key elements here that do a lot of world building for me. But I would definitely say this is probably my anime of the year. Like, God, <laughs> it, it's just so good. <laughs> It was certainly our anime of the year in our awards show, um, and it, it, it deserves it. It does so much so well. Like it, the, Not only are its parts good, the sum of its parts is also really, really good. Um, and I can't wait for more. Um, I could sit here for the next two and a half, three hours and analyze some of the stuff that we saw throughout the entire first season, but um, we've gone over an hour and a half now, and I definitely think it's time um, to wrap this up, unless you have anything else you want to say about uh, Mishoku Tensei before I wrap it up. I mean, I have a lot to say about Mishoku Tensei, but we definitely don't have another two and a half hours of time to do that, so. Yeah, and I'm sure you don't want to edit two and a half hours worth of a podcast. fucking save me. Uh, maybe at some point we'll do a, a WTF episode where we actually just go into stuff like this, like a, like an actual WTF spoiler cast where, you know, we just tell people, Hey, only come if you don't care about spoilers. <laughs> I don't know. It just seems like that'd be a really great way for us to spend two and a half, three hours talking about this stuff because there is definitely, there's stuff that I didn't mention that happened in this uh, season that I could talk about, but in the interest of time, I kind of skipped over a couple of things. Anyway, I'm going to end it here. Thank you all for dropping in to uh, listen to us. Check the description below to find links to Anime Club After Dark on Twitch, on uh, social media, on Discord. Uh, Check out our merch store as well. There's a bunch of stuff you can buy there. Every purchase you make there really does help us out. Uh, With that, I have been your host, Alex, and I will see you next time. Say goodnight, John. Goodnight.